I met Ron at the Night Eagle Cafe in Oxford, New York when it was there. Ron's music and guitar playing is much like his personal aura, quiet, thoughtful, humble, and masterful. And when you hear him, you just want to get to know him. I ran into him again at the Fetish Festival in Guilford, New York. That's right, the Fetish Festival. Don't worry, it's not what you think, which is too bad. I mean, where else might I see a nude woman in clown shoes playing an upright bass? But I did get the opportunity to learn a little more about this wonderful musician and person. I didn't take up the guitar until I was 19, and I was, uh, I was in the Air Force. I was a radar technician, and I was stationed on a, a remote radar site 150 miles north of the Arctic Circle in Alaska. And I was up there for about a year, and about, I had about three months to go, and a friend of mine was leaving, and he had a, he had a guitar that didn't have, he didn't have a case for it. And up there, you, you, you gotta have, I don't know how they got the guitar up there in one piece, but anyway, uh, he sold it to me for $15, and, uh, and I plunked around on it, and just, I didn't know what I was doing, and then, you know, in the service, there's always somebody from down south, country western type guy that can, knows a few chords, and there was a tech rep, civilian tech rep up there that, from uh, Texas. Name was Dudley Daniels. I'll never forget him. And he taught me how to pick this old classic wildwood flower on the guitar. He taught me how to, you know, play the melody note and strum, you know, very, very country. So that's how I got started on the guitar. You played with Harry Chapin. I yeah. mean, how, how did that happen? How did that come about? Well, I was playing Sunday nights in a little bar up in Syracuse called Barge. Playing there every Sunday night. The guy that owned the bar. I, I made a demo tape, and I was going to try to find a manager type. Just a solo, solo guitar? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was going to try to find somebody that could, an agent, or somebody that could book me into some gigs, maybe within a hundred mile radius, you know. But uh, he, he had a friend down near New York City that was uh, a theatrical manager, man, managing a theatrical group. He was also managing a, a group. Uh, called the Chapins, which were Harry's two brothers and two other guys. So I sent him the tape, and the Chapins had a record deal with Epic, Epic and they were getting ready to release their first single. So uh, all of a sudden Harry, who uh, had been doing film work, documentary type film work, uh, decided he would, because the Chapins were doing mostly his music. Harry was always a songwriter. So uh, he was, he decided to put together a group and open up for his brothers uh, in the Village Gate in New York, down, down cellar in the Village Gate. So he went around, he wanted a cellist in the group and, uh, and a guitarist, and he already had a bass player picked out. So uh, this guy that I had sent the tape to, uh, played the period auditioned like 28 guitar players and didn't find exactly what he wanted. So this guy plays Harry that my tape over the telephone and he says, "Hey, get that guy if you can." <laughs> Harry called me up one day and we he bent my ear for 45 minutes, told me exactly what his plan was, how he was planning to go about it, and gave offered the, the deal, uh, how we would uh, we would split the money uh, for gigs and royalties on records. And he's talking all this before we even had a group started, you know. And, uh, we started playing, we were playing six nights a week down in the Village Gate and opening up for, for his brother's band. And uh, then we made a demo tape. Then we got, they started hounding various music critics for different you know different publications there in the city getting them down there all of a sudden we get this fantastic review from a guy that was really hard on, on musicians I mean this guy if he didn't like you you know he'd tear you apart so we got armed with a couple of good reviews then uh, started hitting the record companies and there was a point in that summer of 1971 when we were on an, the auction block between Clive Davis, who was then uh, president and head of Columbia Records, and Jack Holzman, who was the owner of Elector Records, every day they were up in the bid. And we had many other offers too. I mean, we had probably a half a dozen offers from 
other record companies with varying degrees of front money and all that legal mumbo jumbo, you know. So anyway, uh, finally Harry made the decision to go with Jack Holzman because being a much smaller record company, they figured, well, if he's going to invest money in us to prove a point to Clive Davis, I guess, well then that would be the way to go because if you went with Columbia, if your first album flopped, you were history. You know, I mean, they got a million other people to take it. One, one time, one right in the beginning, before we got a contract, we were, Harry was driving, we were in a van, and we were going down to rehearse at the downstairs at the Village Gate. And, because uh, that's where we played all that summer, trying to showcase things. But anyway, Harry's driving down Bleecker Street, and all of a sudden, we look over on the other side of the street, walking along as, uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Harry stops the, the van right in the middle of the road, gets out of the car, and runs over, introduces himself to John and Yoko, and trying to get them to come and see us that night at the at the village gate. Did they come? No. One time when we were doing the Carson show, and uh, our bass player had very thick uh, uh, plastic rimmed glasses, and the day that we were doing the uh, started or we were doing the Carson show, I don't know what happened, but he broke them right here. So he had them taped up with just regular he adhesive tape, and they even put makeup on <laughs> when we went on for the show. They put makeup on there. On well, the glasses? Yeah, on the, on the tape. Oh, okay. Well, of course, we get in under the hot lights. <laughs> And I, you know, we're, we're all ready to start playing. And I look over at John, and the glasses had gone down just like this. And they were like hanging on me. And I, I never came so close to losing it completely. I mean, I was almost doubled over, but I had to, I had to stay cool because if they'd have dropped off, I would have freaked right out. In September of 1974, unbeknownst to the rest of us in the group, uh, Harry would have been one of his dreams, we knew about that. He wanted to do a Broadway type musical. He wanted to be like the first to do a rock musical. You know, that was his idea. Cut and patch gospel. Yeah, well, that's one of them. That's, that, was, okay. that wasn't the original one. The, right. the, the one that, we, that he did was uh, called The Night That Made America Famous. And that was a, that was a song off our third album. I, I left the group at that point because I would have, we had bought a house in Manly, our son was in school, and I would have had to spend either six nights a week in New York, get home one day a week, or move the family down there, which was totally impractical. So I just said, you know, I've had enough, I've had a good time, and, and uh, I, so I gave up all my royalties, all my rights to all that stuff. That was part of our gentleman's agreement. And uh, so I ducked back out of it, and, and I, didn't, I didn't play out for like, almost six years. What are you doing now? Well, I uh, pretty much retired. Uh, now when you say retired, you mean retired from music or retired from? No, no, I I mean, I, the, my partner that uh, we played last night, we've, we've been together almost four years and you know, we're, we don't even go out looking for gigs, but you know, every year we, we play this thing and uh, Colorscape, we're gonna play that for the third time. And we play in a couple of little restaurants in Norwich that uh, once in a great while. So we probably don't play much more than a dozen gigs a year. But we have fun. We, we get together once a week and, and try to write new music and practice and stuff like that. The, the country is so full of talent. I'm just, everywhere you go, there's really talented people and there's only so much room at the top. Basically, you have to be at the right place at the right time. That's really what it boils, boils down to. So, you know, my advice is just love it and, and don't, don't let your dreams get out of hand. Just, just love it and try to be creative and have fun playing. You know? I'm looking forward to your set. Okay. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure talking absolutely, to you. And absolutely. I'm looking forward to your set because... <laughs>